Yeah. Okay, so my name is Jamila Hussein. Some people know me as Jamila Shannan. And my job here is to facilitate a panel that does not need facilitation, because we have four amazing, um, wonderful people here who are going to help us connect the struggles with the US, Palestine, and Mexico. Um, the only way we can connect the struggles is to start with uh, Matoin, who is going to ground us in a frame for us to continue understanding how all of these struggles for liberation are connected. Uh, Matoin Monroe will start us off, and then we'll um, take it to other facilitators. This is very do-it-yourself. Is this going to stretch right now? Good afternoon. My name is Matoi, and I'm co-leader of United American Indians of New England, and um, I'm also a lead organizer for Indigenous Peoples Day campaigns here in the state, including in Cambridge, where we won Indigenous Peoples Day in June of 2016. <laughs> I always say to people that one of the reasons that we do Indigenous Peoples Day is because non-Native people don't listen to us and act as though that we're not here. And we are literally trying to save the earth. And if you, if you can't listen to us, we're not going to be able to do that. So Indigenous Peoples Day is an important first step in bringing Native voices more to the center where they should be. I want to acknowledge uh, before I begin today that we are on stolen indigenous land, the land of the Massachusetts people. This land was never ceded. There is no treaty. They were simply pushed off the land. The river was give, given an English name. The city was given an English name. When I think about al-Nakba and Palestine, it was preceded not only by the Balfour Declaration, but also the British Mandate, Napoleon, the Crusades, the Catholic Church's doctrine of discovery, and many other doctrines. All of these combined represent an entire settler worldview with roots not only in theology, but going further back to the very origins of private property and patriarchy and the rise of the state. First, they justified it with theology, and later, they justified it as the white man's burden and now, as the U.S. does, in the name of supposedly protecting human rights. Under various theological and legal doctrines formulated during and after the Crusades, non-Christians were considered enemies of the Catholic faith and as such less than human. The Dum Diversus Bull of 1452 and other related bulls, those are like edicts ish issued by popes, granted the Pope's blessing to capture, vanquish, and, and subdue the Saracens, pagans, and other enemies of Christ, and put them into perpetual slavery and to take all their possessions and their property. The Interchetera Bull of 1493 granted authority to Spain and Portugal to take all lands and possessions so long as no other Christian ruler had previously claimed them. These bulls, instilled the doctrine of discovery, the papal sanctioning of Christian enslavement and power over non-Christians. Indigenous peoples in the Americas have our own Nakba. That was the invasions of Columbus, Cortez, Cabot, and all the others. When Columbus sailed west across the so-called Sea of Darkness, with the express understanding that he was authorized to take possession of any lands he discovered, that were not under the dominion of any Christian rulers, he and the Spanish sovereigns of Aragon and Castile were following an already well-established tradition of discovery and conquest that was very much focused on Palestine. Acts of genocide and conquest committed by Columbus and his men and all the other invaders against the peaceful native people of the Caribbean were sanctioned. The papal documents were frequently used by invaders in the Americas to justify an incredibly brutal system of colonization, which referred to the territories as being inhabited only by brute animals. With all of this history behind them, of course the British and League of Nations felt free to carve up and dis distribute Palestine. 
Zionist spoke about Palestine as a land without people for a people without a land. And even if the land was inconveniently not entirely empty, it was somehow full of people who had no real connections to the place. They didn't know how to develop and exploit the land the way the Europeans did, the Zionist said. They didn't know how to make the desert bloom, and so they lacked legitimacy on the land. The indigenous people everywhere lose legitimacy because we are somehow not sufficiently there, yet too much there. And then we lose legitimacy because we are made up of nomads who don't really care about the place the way the settled Europeans do. And so Palestinians were pushed onto reservations, really. Refugee camps, Gaza, these are all reservations. Now here, the pilgrims in Plymouth and the Puritans here in Boston and Cambridge, here in this very parish, actually, we always bring history home to where we are. They were obsessed with the idea that they were in a wilderness, as though the land were empty and waiting for them. This idea is so embedded that even today, I hear from school children and adults alike that the Europeans brought civilization here, that indigenous peoples were not actually doing anything with the land. I speak about this to make clear that the U.S. and Israel are both settler nations. Sometimes I have noticed that people here can point to Israel as a settler state, but cannot see that is the case right here. If you claim to support the struggle of Palestinians, then you must also be supporting indigenous struggles right here. Sometimes settlers talk about working toward reconciliation, and that's been the case in Canada. But reconciliation still means you're taking our land and putting pipelines through it and destroying our water, doesn't it? So reconciliation is nice, and apologies are nice, but that is not nearly enough. What we need is decolonization. When we are talking about decolonization, let's review who is here here in the United States. We have indigenous peoples here, many of them now coming from Mexico, El Salvador, and other settler countries, but they're indigenous. We didn't have those borders. We have settlers. They and their progeny stole land and eradicated millions of native peoples in every single inch of stolen state of the United States. Settlers became their own law. They became their own government. They supplanted indigenous laws and beliefs with their own values. We also have millions of stolen peoples, black people whose ancestors were largely brought here as slaves. I've heard sometimes people say that if you're not indigenous, you're, you're a settler. That's not true. Stolen peoples can't at all be called settlers. We also have newcomers who came here after the dirty work of the slaughter and displacement of indigenous peoples, but who often adopt the worldview of settlers. These newcomers benefit from settler colonialism, whether or not they intend to by dint of living on stolen indigenous land. Every aspect of what we do and think needs to be decolonized, treating the earth and life like a commodity, consuming resources endlessly. This is also at the foundation of settler colonialism. I read a good definition of decolonization. It is the intelligent, calculated, and active resistance to the forces of colonialism that perpetuates the subjugation and or exploitation of our minds, bodies, and lands. Decolonization is engaged for the ultimate purpose of overturning the colonial structure and realizing indigenous liberation. Well, I would actually say that decolonization is for the liberation of all of us because all of us are poisoned by settler colonialism. Every aspect of our lives and thought have been impacted. Ultimately, decolonization should lead to the return of control of the land to indigenous peoples. This does not necessarily mean that everybody needs to leave, but it does mean that indigenous people have the right to decide what happens, and that should put a stop to things like pipelines and fracking pretty fast.
I know this idea of decolonization and return of lands and control of indigenous peoples is uncomfortable for settlers to admit to and to talk about, but this fear of who has a right to claim and control the land is very much the basis of settler hatred for indigenous peoples. Finally, as an indigenous human being, I have the utmost feelings of solidarity with the Palestinian people because they are our relatives. Palestinian people must have the right to decide what the fate of their country should be. Their right to self-determination must be respected first and foremost. I believe that all of us must support and learn from Palestinians on their own terms and support their resistance without providing a settler colonial overlay of what we think are acceptable forms of resistance. Thank you. I'm going to pivot over here. So. <laughs> Very good. So um, what we're going to do is uh, thank you for the framing. That was excellent. And what I'm going to do is focus on a comparison between territorial loss in Mexico and what's going on in Palestine now. So, um, and, and the reason why I've been going around doing this presentation is because uh, organizations, Zionist organizations, such as the ADL, the JCRC, are actually inviting leaders of the immigrant community, of the Latino immigrant community in all expenses, uh, uh, paid trips to Israel to show them how good they treat their immigrants, meaning Jews from Europe and, and North America. So, um, okay, so, um, so without further ado, we're gonna um, go on. Uh, I was asked to abbreviate this presentation, but basically, I mean, we all know that, you know, uh, Palestine and, and Mexico are co continents apart, different historical and cultural development. However, where, okay. So um, let, let's do a, a very uh, brief uh, comparison. So in Mexico, the Spaniards invade the New World in the early 1500s, followed by other European empires. In Palestine, after various Eurasian empires ruled the Middle East, Palestine is ruled by the Ottoman Empire. In Mexico, uh, Mexico becomes the possession of the Spanish crown. Palestine becomes a mandate of the British Empire after World War I. In Mexico, in 1821, Mexico gains independence from Spain and outlaws slavery. It's one of the first laws it it's, uh, passes as an independent country. In the 1830s, U.S. Uh, slave state expansionists begin to settle in the Mexican state of Texas, or what you call Texas, um, and campaigns of ethnic cleansing ensue. In the late 1800s, the European Zionist movement plans to ca colonize Palestine. Zionist violence terrorized Christian and Muslim uh, Palestinians in the early 1900s, and campaigns of ethnic cleansing ensue. This is the basic pattern of settler colonialism. In, uh, in Mexico, uh, the, the new state of, uh, the lone state of Texas, declares itself independent from Mexico and is later annexed by the United States. Provoked by U.S. settler aggression, Mexico declares war on the U.S. in 1846. Uh, U.S. invades Mexico, and this is very interesting. Irish nationals in the U.S. infantry defect to the Mexican army. Uh, oh, good. So, have you heard of this story, the San Patricios? Oh, yeah. It's very interesting. Irish Americans won't talk about this, but in Ireland, they will talk about it. Um, in Palestine, in 1947, the UN partition plan is approved with the support of Western powers, but rejected by Arab nations, as we heard before in the various panels. Under the UN partition plan, 55% of historic Palestine is apportioned to, quote, a Jewish state, and Arab states reject the plan. Uh, the Treaty of Guadalupe and, and, and Hidalgo and Al-Nakba. 
Treaty of Guadalupe and Hidalgo is what we consider our Nakba. Uh, in 1848, interesting, 100 years before, 1848, Mexico loses 50% of its national territory to the United States. The newly acquired territories include the states of Texas, Colorado, Nevada, Arizona, Nuevo Mexico, California, Utah, and Wyoming. Nakba, uh, uh, 1948, Palestine loses, as you know, 48% of its land to the Jewish state. Over 750,000 Palestinians are dispossessed from their homes and their lands. Thousands become refugees in their own land or flee to other neighboring countries. And this is very interesting because AFSC does have a lot of uh, history in this area. AFSC is asked by the UN to provide humanitarian relief in the Gaza Strip shortly after the Nakba. Um, well, this is what Mexico used to look like uh, in the entire Southwest and West. Uh, that's what Palestine used to look like. Um, and this here is when Texas declared itself the independent state and uh, seized all this land, including parts of, uh, of uh, Arkansas. Um, and, and this is the partition plan. As we heard before, we don't need to explain it here. Uh, and then afterwards, Texas is uh, next to the newly uh, acquired uh, uh, United States. So basically, what's east of the Mississippi starts becoming part of, of the United States. This is after the, um, uh, the, the war, and um, basically what's left for Palestinians is the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And then, this is Mexico today, as you know. Uh, there's a lot of violence along, along the uh, border, uh, in particular because of the walls and all the security apparatus that the United States is investing, including the state of Israel, as we heard before. So we're, we also looked at manifest destiny and Zionism, because you need an ideology to justify the taking over a territory and also to dehumanize the other person. So manifest destiny is expansionist. Zionism is expansionist. Manifest destiny has the racist notion of civilizing the West. Remember, it was Native Americans and Mexicans that lived in that area, therefore savages. So Zionism is the racist notion of a land without a people for a people without a land, although early Zionists acknowledged that there were many Palestinians living in those lands. Uh, it, uh, Manifest Destiny presumes racial superiority of white people over indigenous and Mexican people. Zionism presumes racial superiori superiority over, uh, of Jews over Palestinians and other Arabs. And this, therefore, justifies ethnic cleansing in both, both historical examples. Two walls. So, basically, in the United States, in 2006, the U.S. Congress passed the Secure Fence Act, which would expand the wall between Mexico and the United States by 700 miles. And just a footnote, I made this presentation back in 2008. Colesman Inc. of New Hampshire, a wholly owned subsidiary of Elbit Systems of Haifa, Israel, builds the high-tech portions of that wall, meaning the motion sensors, the infrared cameras, and all that stuff. Billions of dollars. Uh, and the West Bank, in 2005, the Israeli Knesset approves the plan to build an apartheid wall well within the, uh, the West Bank. Elbit Systems, the largest private military contractor in Israel, builds the apartheid wall inside the well, uh, West Bank. So here we have a direct connection between what's going on in the U.S.-Mexico border and what's going on in the West Bank. Um, this is a rather old map before the, um, the wall was complete. I, I won't go over it now because of time. But basically, um, I organized a delegation of color to go to uh, Palestine in 2008. And we had Asian Americans, Latin Americans, Native Americans, African Americans go to Palestine. And to view Palestine from our particular perspective 
of racial discrimination in the United States, our history of national liberation throughout the world, and indeed our fight for civil rights and, and autonomy here in the United States. So what we learned with talking to our Palestinian brothers and sisters was that the apartheid idea of cantons and Bantu stands are being applied to the West Bank, ever shrinking uh, areas where Palestinians can live and work. We discuss Israeli political, economic, and military relations with apartheid South Africa and the right-wing military dictatorships of Central America during the 1980s. We discuss the impunity police have in killing people of color, incarceration rates, and military-style uh, ICE raids. This was before Ferguson. We learned the idea of transfer, the forceful removal of Palestinians from their land to our other Arab nations is a common political discourse amongst Israeli Jews. And we also talk about gentrification. Uh, we learned about the idea of uh, security and terrorism justifies checks points, arbitrary arrests, detentions, and border militarization. So basically, we learned that together we have one struggle. I think I'm out of time. So this is just a, a, a picture. You know, can you tell that's Palestine? Uh, Palestine? Can you tell that's Mexico? Not really. Um, the fence, same company builds it. Um, one interesting thing, we saw the image of Che Guevara all over uh, the refugee camps. And, you know, that made me feel very warm and comfortable. So, <laughs> so, um, so again, um, you know, this is basically a, a presentation to start a conversation on how we can build an intersectional movement between Latin Americans here in the United States and in Mexico, as well as our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Thank you. things. I, that was amazing, right? Um, it's amazing coming both, to you. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm humbled following those folks and humbled being on a panel with these folks. This is a great panel of people. I feel really um, blessed to be up here. Um, my name is Carl Williams. Uh, I do, uh, by day, I work for the, the uh, American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts, um, and a lot of the rest of my time I do um, uh, legal movement work with the National Lawyers Guild of Massachusetts. Um, that's me. Uh, specifically today, I wanted to talk about um, a declaration, because we're talking about declarations today, right? So 241 years ago, a declaration was drafted, right, by some British folks, right? And uh, it was a colonizing declaration, right? Um, it was an explicitly racist um, declaration. And uh, actually, I closed my phone, but now I need to open it and get back to the quote from that uh, to connect to what um, uh, my sister Matoi said. Uh, just quoting from that declaration, it says, uh, he, speaking about the King of England, he has excited domestic insurrections amongst us, and he has endeavored to bring upon the inhabitants of our frontiers um, the merciless Indian savages, whose only known rule of war warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So the I just say that um, because that's the, people probably realize that's the Declaration of Independence, which a lot of people point to when, when we talk about our, our rights in this country, right, or rights that exist for folks in this country. We point to the Declaration of Independence, and we, talk, we point to the Constitution of the United States of America, which are both demonstrably and unarguably explicitly racist documents, right? The, the Constitution explicitly says that, that black people have... have, uh, have count for three-fifths of a human being, but not in terms of rights. That's for, you know, proportional representation. And it also explicitly talks about how much, and I'll actually do this as a question. Do people know what it says in the second half of that sentence about what Native people count for in terms of proportional representation? Z zero fifths. It was, so black folks counted for three-fifths, Native folks counted for nothing actually. And actually those, those words, um, you actually, if you amend the, the Constitution, you don't take words out, you actually just add words. So those words still exist in the Constitution um, 
I say of this country, I don't say of our country, but of, of that exists, because uh, I learned that from Malcolm X, but of this country, those words still exist. You can go, you know, downtown Boston, and those words are carved in stone, you know, in the lobbies of some buildings. I used to work in the John Hancock building, and it had that, the merciless Indian savages quote, it has that in the wall, where I used to work, right? Um, exactly, right? Um, so I think those are some things uh, that we need to think about. And, and I think some of the, the, the language in, tr in terms of this panel talked about um, joining of movements and, and having solidarity across movements, which I, I explicitly disagree with, right, explicitly. Um, but I, I disagree with it sort of in solidarity. Um, I think, uh, if that makes any sense, it probably doesn't. But um, I think what we're really talking about um, is a movement that has one specific goal. And that goal, and, and folks have said, that goal is liberation, right? That goal is freedom. And um, the, if people know the Dream Defenders, uh, these, uh, an organization in Miami and got kind of spreading nationally across the country, um, Umi Sela, who's a really visionary person and probably one of the best public speakers I've ever heard, um, they have uh, a, a series of kind of revolutionary t-shirts and one of their t-shirts says, um, I've been to the future we won, right? And that's, that's a lot, right? I, I'll say it again because some people say, it, it says, I, I've been to the future. Um, and that, I think, speaks to that, that, that goal of freedom, right? So to me, it is a battle, it is a struggle for liberation that takes place in different ways in different arenas, whether that's um, spray painting graffiti on the wall in Palestine or spray painting graffiti on both sides of the wall um, in Mexico and, um, and in, uh, in the United States, um, whether that's you know, people protesting here in, in Boston or, you know, or in Puerto Rico. Um, but we're fighting for systems that have been created um, at the foundational structures of these countries, um, of the United States and um, of Israel. That's to me, Zionism and systems of white supremacy are two sides of the same coin, right? They're structures that were built to oppress people, to steal land, to steal resources, and create false senses of, of superiority. The system of white supremacy that was invented, whiteness was created in the United States for the United States to build wealth upon the backs primarily of, of people of African descent, of black people. Right? Whiteness was created for that purpose. It exists for that purpose. And it arguably, that means I want to argue with you about it if you don't agree, it arguably is the single most deadly thing that has ever been created in the history of humanity. Right? Nuclear weapons have not killed as many people. Even nuclear power has not killed as many people. Like natural disasters haven't killed as many people. That structure saying you are less than me, therefore I, we can kill you, we can burn you in ovens, we can steal your land, we can bomb you with napalm until you know, a, a tenth of your population no longer exists. Those things become either possible or more possible because of the system of white supremacy that was invented for um, the structure of chattel slavery in the United States of America. And when we talk about it, just as when we talk about the structure of the occupation, um, theft of land, and the, and the uh, you know, stealing of human rights of Palestinian and other Arab people, we need to talk about Zionism, or you cannot have that conversation. You cannot have that conversation without talking about Zionism. When we have the conversation about the United States and its um, this neocolonial and imperial uh, uh, construct around the world, we cannot have that conversation unless at the root of it we're talking about white supremacy. Um, and um, I'll actually just say because it's really inspirational for me. Um, the have people seen this video um, that were that that um, black activists in the United States and Palestinian activists created? It, it's called "When I See Them, I See Us." Yeah. People, if you haven't seen that, see it. Uh, take a look at it. I would show it now. We don't have a, a lot of time though. Um, you should take a look at it. If you've seen it before, see it again. I just watched it again and it really touched me. Um, but organizations are doing that. Dream Defenders actually and uh, Black Lives Matter took a delegation of folks um, in addition to you know, the, the delegations that, that Gabe was talking about, took delegations of black folks and you know, Afro-Caribbean folks um, to Palestine and people had an immediate sense of solidarity. They had a sense of solidarity before but immediately sense a connection with the land and immediate sense of solidarity with um, the struggles that were happening there and the struggles that were happening um, in their homes uh, across the United States. 
But I think, just as an introduction, I just wanted to really say that, really, when we think, I, when I think of these struggles, I think of it as one struggle. If there are, you know, victories in terms of, you know, what is happening in terms of, let's say, the BDS struggle, and I actually just want to say one brief thing about the BDS struggle, and what sounds like, um, you know, 24, 25 states passing legislation criminalizing uh, um, BDS actions in the United States, you, you think that's kind of bad, right? That's pretty, that sucks, right? It is actually, I'm going to make you think of that as a good thing, right? And I'm going to say it real frank, because I disdain respectability politics. They are fucking afraid of us. Yeah. I play chess a lot, and when someone, when you do a really good move and the other side is kind of fucked, this is what someone does. They're like, all right, I need to do something really drastic at this point. I'm going to do something really drastic. And then they do the drastic thing, and you're like, that wasn't, you weren't thinking when you did that. That is them responding to us. That is them losing, right? So now we're at the point I said, look, there's the, the, the structure of the Israeli state. There are activists and organizers, uh, Palestinian-led, taking up the BDS struggle. There's us, that, that structure of people winning a lot of victories in that and clearly changing the dynamic of the discussion. And then they pass anti-BDS legislation, right, which should on its face appear unconstitutional. But if you're hoping for it to be unconstitutional in the court, I'll disabuse you of that notion. Just you know, look on your phone at a picture of the United States Supreme Court. If you're investing, if you're investing your, your belief of liberation and freedom in this struggle on those people, look, seriously, look at a picture. And I, you know, footnote to white supremacy. Footnote to white supremacy. If you think a bunch of people in black robes whose mind, even if they're a little bit more brown or even if they're a little bit more um, gendered as women and you think they're going to save you, you, and, and also the, sh the direction that it's going, it's, you know, centrist at best, diving towards the deep, deep, horrifying right. Um, so I think that they are not going to save us, we are going to save us, right? So I just want to say that about BDS, we are winning, that is plays of desperation, and um, said by people uh, um, long before me, Organized people will beat organized money every single time. And one of the things I think we need to do, really, is dare to dream, do things in more dramatic ways, confront power in real ways, and understand that our liberation is our responsibility. And we, all of us are complicit in oppression in ways. And, you know, and there's a good thing about that, because then we're, we can actually take responsibility, right? None of the, our state legislators, our federal legislators, our pre, the president, um, those people are not going to be part of this liberation. But we can force them uh, to do less and sometimes hide it and actually once in a while do something positive. Um, if we believe that, if we take dramatic action, um, we can make more people be free, and we can be an example um, of freedom for other folks. Thanks. I am humbled and honored to follow the three of you and to be here with Jamila. All of you are my teachers, and I have learned so much from you today, but also in other spaces. And I want to take just an opportunity to thank you all for your work, for being visionaries, for being uh, folks who also pass batons and who are willing and eager for others to take up the struggle, to learn lessons and to be better and to be stronger. I am better because of you and I'm so thankful to be here. I've spent the last seven years of my life, my name is Nadia Ben Youssef and um, I work with the Adala Justice Project. Uh, a sister organization of Adala, the Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights in Israel, where I've spent the last seven years and the first years of my human rights career and my legal career, um, learning from also um, freedom fighters and alongside Palestinians who have a vision for justice that has inspired me beyond measure. Um, but those seven years have also landed me um, often face to face with the, the anxiety of the state of Israel. Um, face to face with them in interrogation rooms. And so I tell this story as a, as a way to build upon what uh, my colleagues and comrades have said. Um, I'll take you to March of this year. 
And, and this has happened every time in the last seven years that I've been able, um, and it's a privilege, to enter, um, enter Israel to work with Adala. Um, but my last name is Ben Youssef, um, said with a U and not an O, and that becomes quite important when someone says, how do you pronounce your last name? Um, because Yosef is something, and Yusuf is something else. I learned this only in Israel, actually. Um, and so I answer the question, Yusuf, and they say, come with us. So Yusufs go to the Arab room, as those of us who've been there and, and have a Yusuf in our name understand, and another Arab or Muslim names, or have darker skin, or are, are perceived in some way as a threat to, to the status quo. So they, they say, come with us, and so you're in the Arab room. I've been there for the last seven years. And what's interesting about this, this position is what I learn what I learn about the empire, what I learn about Israel in those spaces of interrogation. So I was there in March of this year, 2017, um, and I had an interrogator named Jason. And there's always a moment when the interrogation turns. Um, after kind of the niceties of where are you from, what are you doing, what's Adala, um, something happens and there's a shift. You feel the air tighten around you, the temperature drops. And so in the past, so starting into say 2010, when I was entering the country in 2010, the interrogation turned on this, this question. Who do you know that's organizing direct action? Are you connected with, the, with ISM, the International Solidarity Movement? Who's leading the protests in the Nakab? Who do you know in the West Bank that's organizing direct action? Who's leading those Friday protests? Who is on the ground doing that work? That's when the intensity would increase, starting in 2010. Then we're having a wave of discriminatory legislation that's passing um, in Israel starting in 2011. One of those was the anti-boycott law uh, that was passed in 2011, upheld by the Israeli Supreme Court in 2015. Adela worked on this case, challenged the BDS law of Israel, and that became an obsession for the state. The state was obsessed with BDS, who I knew, what was going on, what was Adala's interest in this, what was our legal arguments, who in the United States is organizing on BDS, am I a part of the BDS movement, am I calling for boycott of Israel, do I believe in sanctions, uh, what do you mean by divestment? The interrogation would turn on BDS. And that was, that really, it took me, a, took us a long time, and Adala's answer, because Adala, as a Palestinian organization based in Israel, because of this law, has a prohibition on it with regard to the call for, for BDS. So the, the law says that if you call for boycott, um, it had created a new civil wrong. You can be sued in court if you call for a boycott of Israel. So Adala has pivoted its, its um, argument about BDS to say we, call for, we are for the right to boycott. That's my, that has been my answer in interrogation. That is my answer um, in public forum. We, call, we support the right to boycott. And Israel, and as I understand through interrogation, has become okay with that, actually. So Jason, Jason, we're in March 2017. Why is your name Jason? I don't know. But Jason says, so tell me about BDS. This is actually part of the niceties. The interrogation didn't turn. Tell, tell me about BDS, and I said, well, Adela supports the right to boycott. Um, there is a right to boycott, freedom of expression. Um, we believe in it wholeheartedly. We also believe in the pillars of the BDS movement. <laughs> and I went as far as I could, and Jason said, okay. And then Jason turned away for, from his computer, closed his book, and looked at me and said, tell me about intersectionality. <laughs> like this. And I, I mean, I couldn't help it. Like a smile erupted in my face. And I said, that's, that's the interrogation question. And I said, well, amazingly, it's started by black feminists. Um, it's an idea that in our oppressions are interlocked. And it was actually coined by a legal scholar named Kimberly Crenshaw. He said, Nadia, that's not what I mean. You know that's not what I mean. He said, what are you doing to connect struggles that have nothing to do with each other you're creating confusion, you're creating chaos. We as the government are completely opposed to these efforts to build solidarity and a cross-movement struggle. And I said, we are winning. In my head, I said, we are winning, to Carl's point. 
When you see the empire tremble, that's where you know where to push. That is where you know where to push. That is what scares the state. When it looks out and, set and sees groups of people connected, yes, of course, by their oppression, understanding that their oppressions are linked, but who are joining forces because they believe, even more so, that their liberations are tied. That is when the system is dismantled, and that is when we win. And so when we look at our advocacy strategies moving forward, I encourage you in your own life, certainly, but as community organizers, as activists, as artists, as teachers, as human rights defenders, as politicians, as nurses, think about this. This is when we win. And I would say a few things just about what we can learn from intersectionality so that we can continue moving this conversation forward. But really, um, all that I wanted to say has been said. Intersectionality, actually, in the way that Jason understood it, in the way that we have talked about it as well, I mean, it has kind of two different ideas. One is kind of a popular understanding of intersectionality, which we actually are thinking about as, as joint struggle. When we're talking, when Jason said intersectionality, he was thinking less about um, the black feminist thought from which it comes, the academic idea of intersectionality, and he was thinking more about cross-movement building and the idea that this is one struggle. That's what he was thinking about. And in fact, it's interesting that those terms have been conflated um, because we can learn a lot from the analysis of intersectionality within our movements. And in fact, our joint struggle or our one struggle is strengthened, is protected from fragmentation, actually can win when we have an intersectional analysis. When we center the experiences of those most impacted by oppression, when we center native history and native visions of liberation, then you start understanding exactly what um, world we're trying to create. So I think, and actually Giacomo, I don't know if you're still here, but Giacomo asked a great question when he was looking at the Arab Spring. And he asked, you know, how can we make sure that we're not replicating systems of oppression in our movements, in our liberation, in our freedom? And that is the intersectional analysis. And of course, a young person is bringing that up as his question and saying, that's what I'm concerned about. How do I know that everyone will get free and not just those who are buying into neocolonial models, as you said, Giacomo, those who are benefiting from systems of um, economic systems, neoliberal models. So they're asking us really to think differently about what liberation looks like. So centering the most impacted is a critical conversation that comes from intersectionality and should be the way that we organize our movements. Um, intersectionality also tells us something about how trauma can coexist with privilege. Intersectionality demands that of us. Where, as Carl said, are we complicit in systems of oppression? What do we need to relinquish about our own power and our own privilege in order for all of us to be liberated? And I think that becomes really important, and it becomes important with the story of, of Israel as well. Trauma can coexist with power and privilege. That's what intersectionality tells us. And I want to move a little bit to just kind of my own analysis when it had, how it has shifted my understanding of my work in the United States. So Adela, three years ago, said, go to the U.S., uh, map the movement, see where we should intervene, um, what does it look like to build a mass movement for Palestinian rights, um, and to kind of shift American discourse and ultimately policy. And so initially I was, I was doing kind of, well, where, where are we actually working now, and was seeing at the time in 2013, you know, a lot of focus on convincing the oppressor convincing the oppressor, demanding that those in power recognize the humanity of those who, of whom they've stripped that power, R recognize our humanity. And that was our target as a movement. We were saying, please, like, and we were going like this. We were lifting up, going to those with the power. What this, what the, has happened over time, and you know, we've, we spoke about it, and Yusuf mentioned it in the summer of 2014, and how our movement has shifted, is suddenly we said, we're going to stop doing that. The power is actually when we do this. This is where the power is. And what we're doing is not advocating to those with power to relinquish a bit of power, because it's creating an alternative nexus of power. 
an alternative nexus of power. Say it again. No, sorry. <laughs> I said the one we want. That's the one we want. <laughs> That's the one we want. No, it's totally right. Build like this. See in your life where you are building like this and reaching and asking and build like this, where, where, the power, where the power is real. And so in that, our advocacy strategy kind of shifted. And what we said is we need to de-exceptionalize Israel-Palestine in American discourse. De-exceptionalize Israel-Palestine. This is not a unique issue that history has nothing to say about, that we have no progressive um, or no value system that can really absorb what's happening in Israel-Palestine. In fact, we do. You have all the tools at your disposal. So on one hand, I love and I'm grateful and I took 18 pages of notes from the scholars and researchers who led us and grounded our discussion today. But oftentimes, complexity is also a tool of empire. Complexity is a tool of empire. It makes us think, I can never know that much. I can never study that much. I didn't write a book. I don't have a PhD. I'm not Jewish. I'm not Palestinian. I don't... How in the world can I have an opinion on this issue? And I say you have an opinion because you are a human being and you understand the value of what that means. And so we need to de-exceptionalize Israel-Palestine, demystify. This is not complicated. It might be difficult in that it is always difficult to wrest power from those who have stolen it. That's difficult. That's not complicated. And then on the last point, I will say just for us to start thinking, and as we're moving into the workshops and we're building advocacy strategies, we're starting to understand exactly what our role is now in this moment, which is different. It's different, and it's better, because we can learn from history. Certainly, joint struggle is not a new idea. It's not a new idea. Our elders have been engaged in this since the beginning of struggle, recognizing that our liberation is tied. But with this intersectional analysis, we have something better. We have something better, and we have a protection from the fragmentation, from the discord that is generated when certain people within movements have more power than others. So we have a tool. And I would just say, as we're, this might be also kind of moving away from respectability, which is the way we should go, for sure. But we've talked a lot about uh, PEPs in our movement. PEPs, which are progressive on everything but Palestine. PEPs, okay? So we thought, okay, these are the, this is the problematic thing. We have to show them that they're actually not progressive. We have to try to align their progressive values with, with the liberation of Palestine. And I would say, okay, so that's an issue, certainly. PEPs are an issue, but more problematic to me now, and I hope to us in the future and moving forward, are what we call poops. <laughs> and poops are progressive only on Palestine. Progressive only on Palestine. And to those, I say, there's the door. If you are here because you believe that Palestinians alone deserve liberation, you are not part of this movement. If you are here because you believe that Palestinians should be free at the expense of others, you are not part of this movement. If you are homophobic, you are not part of this movement. If you are supporting institutions and ideologies of white supremacy, you are not part of this movement. You are part of this movement if you stand for native liberation. You are part of this movement if you stand for black power. You are part of this movement if you are here because this is a global struggle for justice, that we are part of a community that struggles for justice, and that is why you are here. If there's any other reason, there's the door. This movement is huge. We are numerous, but we are numerous when we realize that we are interconnected, that our struggles are tied, and that our liberation is only ours when we are there together. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. With peps and poops, <laughs> we open the floor for questions. Um, being mindful of time, please make it a question. The shorter, the more questions we can get. You can line up here. And depends on how many people, we may get two or three questions and then give it back to the panelists 
so they can address the issues that you bring up. You can go ahead. Can you hear? And our greatest force is to stay connected for that. How do we do that with so many different agencies focused on what you just mentioned, you know, a certain point whether it's not done or it, it seems to be fragmented. We're somewhat fragmented. And the idea is to pull us all together because the strongest weapon we have is choice. And the numbers are in all of us. And we need to pull all that together. How do we do that? Maybe we can take two more questions and then turn it on to the panelists. Thank you all. Our bright future is clearly unfolding, and I'm really, really excited to be alive right now. My question is really specific and related to hers. And the, the thing that has been coming up on and on is we've been so engaged in fight, which is, you know, me. Okay, so I'm going to pass the mic. Who would like to? I can just briefly say the first one. Um, for the, the first person asked the question, I, I think a lot of times I hear people use this word and they say, oh, I'm an activist on Palestine or an activist for you know, racial justice. People should think of themselves more and try to be more of organizers, mm. right? We want to get. You're not like the soldier in the trench. We want to have people who are organizers, who are bringing people together. And that is, there are so many people who, because of the media system in, in this country, because of what is told to us by the white supremacist system, who have no idea. They say Palestinian terrorist. Like, it's, those are synonyms in their mind. There's a very, if people don't have deep-set ideas about that, it's very easy to dispel those notions. Go to schools, speak, get thrown out, like... Nancy Murray does when she goes to high schools and gets thrown out. But do those things, have those discussions with people, whether it's in churches and mosques and synagogues and temples, in schools, on street corners, pass out flyers. Go to places and do that organizing work in your workplaces. Stir up some trouble. Maybe get fired from where you work because you're saying the right thing. I'm not kidding. Um, but doing those things are things that are, and do things that might be a little bit more risky than you thought you could do, right? Be an organizer. And we, there's a history in this country any, look at the history of the struggles of black folks in this country, look at the history of struggles of women in this country, look at the history of struggles of LGBTQ people in this country, and the victories of those people. And I'll just selfishly say for black people, at literally every decade for black people's existence in this country, I actually went back and started looking, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna write something about this. Every decade, you can see ma major victories for liberation that black people have won in this country. It through organizing over hundreds and hundreds of years. So do that copy that work and use that um, to build uh, strength and power and, and knowledge, right? So I think um, that is the first thing. And in terms of the fight love, sort of fight versus love, we, we fight because we want to build a beloved community, right? That's our goal, right? I said freedom, beloved community, same thing. But our goal is to build that. Sometimes you have to fight to do that. Sometimes you have to. Um, in terms of fragmentation, um, we're only as fragmented as we want to be. We're only as fragmented as how we want to be limited. If we all, all we want to do is pass a piece of legislation that uh, is particular to one particular sector in the struggle against, uh, for, um, for, for freedom and justice, and then, you know, we're not doing this right. We have to do the connections. And that's part of this presentation that I do. I work with a population of people that are mostly undocumented. Palestine is not the first thing on their minds. ICE is. Raids are. Okay? But there's got to be a way that this can be introduced when you are talking about broader issues of, of social and economic justice, which is why I created this presentation. 
and, and the other thing, uh, I, I heard somebody just quote Che Guevara, the, uh, the true revolutionary is motivated by deep sentiments of love. Just one more point on fighting and loving. Um, I, I spoke recently to a Diné poet, Orlando White, um, who I'm working on a, a, an exhibit. Um, and he's, he lives in Navajo Nation, Navajo poet, and he's telling me about Diné language, um, indigenous language, and how English language has really stripped language of its, of its humanity, or, uh, stripped objects of their humanity, of their energy, of their spirit. Um, and he was telling me, for example, in Diné, the, the word for computer is the metal is thinking. And so he says, so we, we devoid, English devoids people of the, or objects of their, of their humanity and their spirit. But he says, you know, what's interesting is that the word for white people, the word for white people in Diné translates as people who like fighting. People who like fighting. It's not about skin tone. It's not about... Um, it's about conquest of land, it's about takeover, it's about fighting. And I think what I realized as he said this is that so much of our advocacy efforts that are designed to talk to white people or those who benefit from white supremacy feel like battles. They feel like fights. I leave those spaces exhausted. I'm so tired. But when we are building with those who understand systems and structures of oppression and who are resisting every day to dismantle those systems, that's energizing because that's love. That's love. And so it's a very different type of organizing and advocacy. So I think to sustain us, that's the kind of advocacy and that's the kind of world we should be building. Uh, thanks, everybody. I, hmm? Yeah, I just want to, to ask the panel or the organizers, if it is at all possible to uh, transcribe today's uh, presentation in a booklet, small booklet. Each presentation, the one on Mexico, Palestine, the one on Native Americans, the one on African American, and, and the one on, um, on uh, what is, yeah, on Palestine well, and Adala. Yes. Just because I think, the, I think, I think be, because I felt it was so learning and they are basics and uh, principles, uh, all of them. So I, th I really suggest that you will do uh, many people great favor if you just write all what you've said today uh, in blueprint, you know, not, not very complicated, using your word, that complication is, um, what is it? Complication is the instrument Tool of, of empire, yeah? exactly. So just, if it is possible at all to transcribe it into a small booklet, it is, all of them are great. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this excellent presentation, very inspiring. I just want to say something about intersectionality and ask you a little bit to reflect on it because I think you pointed it out very nicely, but I think it's important to remember that intersectionality 30 or 40 years ago had a different word, which was solidarity. And mm. we are not inventing the, the, the you know, we, we, what is very important is understanding how solidarity always existed and what, what time does it get marginalized that we need to reinvent it and give it a new buzzword that in the end is important because we are, we ha words are important, but it's also important to situate it in a historical context because every generation gave and I think every generation made mistakes and is especially today when we're talking about intersectionality which is basically solidarity, try to understand and be careful from the pitfalls that we can get into without realizing that we might get into it. So that's something that I wanted to mention out there. Thank you. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Leila, for reminding us of that important historical context. Um, I may be older than you, Leila, so I remember when it was called internationalism, okay? 
And that was a time when national liberation movements sought solidarity with each other, not because of a transactional concept of, of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. No, it's because your liberation is intimately and intrinsically tied to the liberation of my people, whether it's in Latin America, Africa, Asia, or the Middle East. However, what happened was the internal contradictions of the Cold War kind of imploded the manifestation of, of internationalism. But, um, you know, if you go to my house, I still have all those nice posters from <laughs> the 70s and 80s. <laughs> and, Okay, thank you very much. I do agree this needs to be transcribed because quite often we can talk about history and analysis and at the end of the day we are left with, and what do I do? What am I supposed to do with all this information? Education is supposed to be part of organizing. Education in and of itself is not what's going to liberate us. We cannot get free without learning the facts and also loving, just back to that question, it's not we fight and then we love. We fight because we love. Those of us who are fighting are fighting precisely because we are full of love. So I'm not worried about then figuring out how to love because I'm always going to be loving. I look forward to a day when I don't have to fight. So that's, that's not a concern. And the other thing, I'm remembering the words of Cornel West when he says the only way you can actually hope is when you realize that you have known hopelessness. For those of us who have had moments where we struggle with finding where our hope comes from, our hope becomes a much more disciplined force that keeps us going. When I first came to the US, the first thing that struck me was how little people, people talk about indigenous people, about the land, how people freaked out at Harvard when in my first week I asked, whose land is this? <laughs> I did not know that after all these years and after everything, they refused to talk about colonialism. My students throw the word colonialism right and left. They think it's fancy. They think it makes them sound smart. Without understanding settler colonialism in this continent, it is going to be very, very difficult for us to get free. All of us, in whichever ways we want to talk about. As indigenous people, and I'm speaking as a Palestinian, we're not fighting for civil rights. We are fighting for decolonization. Yes. Unless we talk about that, Unless we talk about the land that was stolen from us, all the souls and the spirits, the way we have been eliminated and continue to be eliminated as indigenous, as the people with the rightful right to the land. Because elimination doesn't mean that they kill us all physically. But the fact that you can live in the US for many years, I was just talking to a group of people last week, some of them had been here for 20 years, and they didn't know much about the indigenous reality of this country, of this land. I think that is, as a Palestinian, when people come to talk to me about 1967, 1948, I always say, it depends on where we're starting. Where does history start? It did not start there. So as people fighting for our liberation, it is important for us to ask ourselves, how back do we go? And unless we understand the colonial reality of this land, it becomes very hard for us to actually work towards freedom, everybody's freedom. Thank you all. Yeah, I thought that was a fantastic panel. Thank you all very, very much.